Beloved brothers and sisters, yesterday we heard about the Battle of Khaybar. There is something that happened in the Battle of Khaybar that we need to make mention of. As the fortresses were being opened one after the other, the Prophet ﷺ had sat down for one of his meals. And he had had some of the food that was given to him by the Jewish people of Khaybar, who were now slowly but surely fortress by fortress becoming from amongst those who were under the Muslimin, because as you know, the Muslims became victorious one after the other. So the Prophet ﷺ, as he was eating, he put a piece of meat into his mouth and he chewed it very little and immediately spat it out. And he said, where did this come from? The Prophet ﷺ surprised his companions by spitting this piece of meat out. And he was told it was a gift given by one of the Jewish ladies of Khaybar. So the Prophet ﷺ immediately said, there is poison in this piece of meat. How do you know, O Messenger ﷺ? He says, according to some of the narrations, the piece of meat itself informed me that there is poison in me. Subhanallah. So this was the gift of Rasulullah ﷺ. Then he called this lady and he asked her, is this from you? She said, yes. Did you put poison in it? She was shocked. She said, yes. So the Prophet ﷺ said, and why did you do that? So she says, because you claim to be a prophet. If you were a prophet, I knew you would know. And if you were not, we would have got rid of you. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Na'udhu billah. Now what had happened is, there was a companion of the Prophet ﷺ known as Bishop ibn al-Bara, who had eaten from the same meat and he died almost instantaneously. Radiallahu anhu. So the Prophet ﷺ decided to forgive the lady and he told her, it's okay, you are forgiven. But it is reported that the heirs of Al-Bara or Bishr ibn Al-Bara did not forgive her because one was attempted murder and the other was murder. So for the attempted murder, the Prophet ﷺ forgave her. But as for the other one, Sahabi, who was murdered, she was executed as a result. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding and protect us and may he not make us from amongst those who engage in this type of behavior. Thereafter, in the eighth year of Hijrah, in Jumad al-Ula, the Prophet ﷺ decided to prepare a huge army of 3,000 men to go and tackle the Ghassanites who had executed his messenger, meaning the ambassador sent by Muhammad ﷺ by the name of Al-Harith ibn Umayr al-Azdi. He was killed by Sharhabil al-Ghassani. And therefore the Prophet ﷺ prepared a huge army because he knew these people were under the Romans. They fell under the Roman Empire. And secondly, they had been preparing armies to come and attack Medina Munawwara, to attack the Muslimin because they did not want the religion of Islam to come forth. So there were many reasons and the Prophet ﷺ ordered his companions. He said, look, the leader is going to be Zayd ibn Haritha, radiallahu anhu, the most beloved to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Remember the man, as a young boy, he accepted Islam. He was a slave freed by Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, refused to go back to his parents. We made mention of him several times in these episodes. He, from being a slave, was now the leader of the Muslim army, the biggest up to that point. There was no army that had had 3,000 strong men up to that point. Later on there was, but at that point it was the biggest ever. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Zayd ibn Haritha will be the leader with the flag. If he is martyred, Ja'far ibn Abi Talib anhu will take over from him. Who was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib? He had just come back from Abyssinia. He had just come back from Abyssinia. Remember he went, he spoke to the Negus. Najashi in Abyssinia and so on. That was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. He had come back just when the victory of Khaybar was declared. And if you remember, we said yesterday he was given from amongst or from part of what was received on the day of Khaybar. So the Prophet ﷺ said, then if Ja'far is martyred as well, then Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu, who was one of the poets of the Prophet ﷺ, he used to say a lot of poetry, powerful words in defense of Islam. 
and the Muslims. So he should take over as a third leader. And the Prophet ﷺ gave them instructions. And as he was accompanying them to the outskirts of Medina Munawwara, he told them, fight in the path of Allah, in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Remember why you are going, in order to seek revenge for the execution of your brother. These people have engaged in a war crime. We need to stop them. And we need to make a statement. And we need to ensure that they realize and understand they cannot do this. And so the Prophet ﷺ tells them, those people you will find from amongst them Christians. If you see them in their churches, do not attack them in the places of worship. This is an Islamic ruling. You do not attack the people who are worshipping in their places of worship. Even though they may be worshipping falsely, we believe that if they are worshipping in their places of worship, you don't attack them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. Where are the Muslims today? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructed them, you do not kill a female. You do not kill a female. And you do not harm a child. You do not harm a female, nor do you harm a child. Nor do you harm an old man who is not even taking part in the war. You don't harm them. Nor do you become destructive regarding the environment by destroying trees and so on. Or by breaking buildings. You don't do that. So this was an Islamic teaching that we are not to be destructive regarding the infrastructure and the environment. It was un-Islamic. And this was a beautiful lecture sermon given to those who were going to the place known as Mu'ta by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Thereafter, they had proceeded. When they got close to Mu'ta, they noticed that the Romans had come with hundreds of thousands of people. Not just a thousand, two thousand. They were three thousand men. But the Romans were one hundred thousand and from amongst the Christian Arabs and the other tribes nearby, they had gathered another one hundred thousand approximately. The smallest figure that makes mention of their number is one hundred and fifty thousand in total. And the biggest figure takes it to three hundred thousand. So they were somewhere between these two figures because they were so huge, the Muslims could not actually count exactly how many they were, but these were estimates. So the estimate is between 150,000 to 300,000 people. So now came the day, subhanallah, they met in Mu'tah, small army of the Muslimi. And what had happened? A large army under the Roman Empire had come to fight the Muslimin. As they got together, there was a discussion. Should we fight them? Should we not fight them? Should we fight them? We've been instructed by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to fight. What should we do? Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu got up and he gave his speech. Remember, he was third in charge. First was Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. Then was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib. And then was Abdullah ibn Rawaha. So he got up and he gave a speech. He said, do you know what? We have been instructed by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his instructions are clear. Victory is never by numbers. Victory is never by how much power you have. Victory is in the hands of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Victory is never because of your large numbers or the enemy's small numbers. Nor is it because of their large numbers or our small numbers. It is by the will of Allah. We should obey the instruction of Allah and His Messenger and we will fight for the cause of our deen. And this is when Subhanallah, He made mention to them that look, we are going to receive some form of a victory. Either we are martyred and we have victory or either we win over them and we have a victory physically here in the dunya, in this world to start with. So when he gave that lecture, they all agreed to continue fighting. And as they fought, subhanallah, there was a severe battle. Two different types of people. You had the Romans on one hand, the Arabs on the other hand. And the Muslims, in fact, on the other hand. Because from the Roman army were also a few Arabs who were Christians and various others. They had decided to fight the Muslims. The Muslims were only going there in order to revenge and retaliate the killing of their man, subhanallah, who was Al-Harith ibn Umayr al-Azdi, who was sent by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with a letter. And instead of get, receiving the letter, he was executed. So this is why they were there. Now they were being attacked. They had no option but to fight. 
and they decided subhanallah to continue with that particular war subhanallah the muslims were attacked they did not lose many lives but what the romans decided to do is the leader the one holding the flag he is the one who needs to be executed so that the muslims can feel that their army has no leader but they did not know the prophet sallallahu had already told them if this one is martyred the next one if that one is martyred the next one abdullah ibn rawaha radiallahu anhu and the others make mention of how they had in fact he was crying tears and he was making mention of some poetry as they were leaving al-madin al-munawwara and they told him what is it that is making you cry so he says the verses came to my mind regarding that little bridge that is going to be over Jahannam, over the hellfire that everyone is going to have to cross. I'm wondering how I'm going to do. There is a thin bridge like a hair which is on top of Jahannam, on top of hellfire. Every single human being will have to cross over that. And depending on your belief in Allah, you will either cross over it very quickly or you will slip into Jahannam. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So that is what was making him cry. And yet he was going out to fight in the battle of Mu'ta. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum say, we knew that they were going to be martyred one after the other because never before had the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam selected more than one leader and said, if this one is martyred, then the next. And if that one is martyred, then the next. So so very soon, Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu was martyred. Today, if you go to Urdun, to Jordan, you will find in the southern part of Jordan, this place where Mu'ta, the battle of Mu'ta took place, and the graves of these companions are there. Subhanallah. Zayd ibn Haritha radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam loved him so much, he was martyred on that day. Thereafter, the flag was taken by Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. He was a man. And we will mention what type of a man he was. He was related very closely to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was the brother of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And at the same time, a cousin of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He was married to Asma binti Umais radiallahu anha, who had gone to Habasha and Abyssinia with him. And he was a man, they say later on, on that day, we found more than 90 injuries on his body. But to our surprise, not a single one was on his back. They were all on the front, which means he didn't run away on that day. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us goodness. When he was martyred, what happened is Abdullah ibn Rawaha took the flag. And in no time, Abdullah ibn Rawaha radiallahu anhu was also martyred. One, two, and three. And after that, the Sahaba radiallahu anhu began to think, what should we do here? And subhanallah, they decided, Uqbah ibn Amir radiallahu anhu, he told them, look, if we are going to run away, we will be killed anyway by these Romans, and we will die with injuries on our backs. And if we face them, we will die with injuries on our fronts. So we are Muslimin, we are believers, we have to continue in this particular cause. And this is when they said, let us select a leader. Who can we select? Now there was a new Muslim from amongst them who was a great warrior before he had accepted Islam. You recall yesterday we made mention of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. He had been sent out to Mu'ta with the, by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa instructions just after he accepted Islam, not as a leader, just as a person, ordinary warrior who was going with the army. But at that particular stage, the Muslims themselves appointed him because they knew him to be a warrior and they knew him to be a master at war. Up to this day, the armies of the world study the life of Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu and look at the tactics that he used. Allah had given him the power and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had given him so much intelligence. When Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu took the flag, they say in the evening they decided tomorrow morning Khalid is our leader from tomorrow he will decide what's happening. He immediately changed. Those on the right side were put to the left. Those on the left were put to the right. Those at the back were put to the front. And those in the front were put at the back. People were wondering why is he doing this? But you know, nobody asks questions. And when the Romans saw this, they thought that large numbers of people have come from Medina because they were different people they were looking at now. 
So they were totally confused, a whole new lot of people. And this was Khalid ibn al-Walid. At that point, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sitting in Medina Munawwara. And he is sitting with his companions and he tells his companions, Zayd ibn Haritha has been martyred. And now Ja'far has taken the reins and he, and he has also been martyred. And Abdullah ibn Rawaha then took the reins and he has also been martyred. And now one of the swords of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has taken the reins. Now the war has become very, very tense. And now it is actually upon the moment of heat. So everyone knew Khalid ibn al-Walid had taken the reins. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam had not instructed them to make Khalid a leader. But he knew sitting in Medina Munawwara what had happened. And he was informing them because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed it to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was also one of the miracles of Nubuwa. And as for Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, he fought. For seven days they had fought. And slowly, slowly he was moving slightly back. Moving slightly back meaning not retreating as in turned around and ran away. No. But he was moving back. These large numbers of people, they continued thinking that assistance is coming from Medina Munawwara. Backup is coming from Medina. And at the same time, they felt that these Muslims are drawing us further and further into the desert. We are moving further and further back. So they were worried. And yet with Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu, it was a strategy of war. They say thousands of the Romans were slain on that particular day. And from amongst the Muslims, only 12 people lost their lives in the battle of Mu'ta. Subhanallah. This was the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The war then stopped because the Romans did not proceed further and the Muslims continued going back. The Romans felt if we go into the desert, we don't know the desert. And if we go there, what might happen to us, perhaps they are trying to take us to a point where they can block us completely. So we are not going. They did not go and the Muslims continued going further back. When they got to al Madinatul Munawwara, some of the people began to say, Ya Furrar, O oh, you who ran away from the war. They heard the news. Oh, you who ran away, you people ran away, you should have gone forward. And the Prophet wasallam immediately got up and he said, Balhumul Qurrar, insha'Allah ta'ala. No, they are not those who run away. They are those who shall return, insha'Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why? Because how can you say they ran away? It was a strategy of war. They had made the statement and it was a powerful statement, a small army, not even a fraction of those they were facing and yet if you take a look at the losses on that particular day or on those days and what had happened in those seven eight days subhanallah you will find that the muslims were indeed considered the mightier people had they been given the opportunity to be equal in number may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding and so this is khalid ibn al-walid from that day he was known as sayfullah the sword of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the reasons why he never died, he did not die in the battlefield, was because if he died in the battlefield, people would have said the sword of Allah was destroyed. So this is why Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu died later on, on his bed, as we made mention of a few days ago. That was Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. Now let's get to Asma binti Umais radiallahu anha, the wife of Ja'far. Ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Ja'far ibn Abi Talib, he was mutilated quite badly on that day. He was given two wings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with which he will be flying in Jannah. This is a hadith which is authentic. Subhanallah. So this is why they call him Ja'far, the one with wings. In fact, Abdullah ibn Umar says, whenever I used to meet his son, I used to say, O oh, son of the one who has been granted wings. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a rank in Jannah as well. And if you look at her, his Ja'far ibn Abi Talib's wife, Asma bint Umayz, she, when she heard the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ask for her children, she said, have you got some news about Ja'far? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, yes, he is martyred in the path. And this was before they had returned. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had informed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and so she began to cry and she began to weep subhanallah and 
Allahu Akbar. She was from amongst those who was very, very close to her own husband. They had gone to Habasha together. They had struggled together. They came back together. They were so close to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as well. It is reported that later on, she, after the period of Idda had expired, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu proposed to her and married her. And he had a son from her known as Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu passed away, she was then proposed for by Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. And she was married by him and she bore several of the children of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. This was Asma bint Umais. The reason I make mention of this, look at the companions. See, they did not marry for lust and desire. They married in order to protect people. These widows, these people who were from amongst the leaders of Islam, although they were females, they were always under the guardianship of the highest of people from the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. Thereafter, as they came back from Mu'tah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately decided to send Amr ibn al-As with 300 men to sort out the people of Qudaa. Who were they? They had sided with the Romans against the Muslims. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wanted them to learn a lesson. So therefore, there was a battle known as Zatul Salasil because of the name of the place where the battle took place. Zatul Salasil means the battle or the place of the chains. It's reported that what the Romans used to do at some stage, when the people did not want to fight, they used to tie them with chains and bring them to the war front so that they wouldn't run away. Now this is so bad if you look at it. You cannot shove war down the throats of people. The warriors must be warriors. That is when they will succeed. But this is why, subhanAllah, they were known as very uh, people who were full of cowardice. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. So Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu went there and when he saw that the Romans had also had a few of the people there and there was quite a large army, he then called for assistance from Medina Munawwara. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent Abu Ubaidah, Amr ibn al-Jarrah with 200 men. It's reported that Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu were also, anhuma were also from amongst them. And when they got there, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu refused for them to light a fire, although it was quite cold in the evening. And some of them were a little bit upset. Why can we not light a fire? He said, I am the leader. The Prophet sallallahu made me a leader here. You follow my instructions, no lighting of the fire. And when the war started the following day, the enemy within hours was actually retreating. They ran away. Some of them were executed and the rest of them ran away. And in no time the Muslims were victorious, a statement was made. As this, this army was returning to al Madin al munawwara it is reported that many of the tribes pledged allegiance with the Muslims to say, we want to be under your protectorate. And many people entered the fold of Islam as well. And from amongst those who were under the protectorate of the Muslims after that was Uyayna ibn Hisn al-Fuzari, the same man who had come to fight the Muslims in Medina Munawwara with the allies. And remember, he was from amongst the Ghadafan who had tried to strike an agreement with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the days of Ahzab when they had dug a trench around al Madina al Munawwara. This man and his little clan had joined the protectorate of the Muslims as they had returned. Later on, he even accepted Islam before the victory of Mecca. This Uyayna ibn Hisn, he became known as Radiallahu Anh at a certain point. So as the Muslims had returned, they got to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam saying, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, two things we want to ask you, a few things we want to ask you. Firstly, Amr ibn al-As radiallahu anhu did not allow us to light a fire. Now they had won and come back, so they wanted to know why. And secondly, when we had won, we wanted to run behind the enemy. And we wanted to get hold of them as they were running away. And he told us, no, stop. The fact that they are running away, it's enough. Why did he do this? So the Prophet ﷺ asked him and he responded with such a brilliant response. He says, we were smaller in number than them. Had we lit fires, they would have realized that our numbers are so small. Listen carefully because this is going to come to help a little bit later on. The statement of Amr ibn al-As, he was an intelligent man. He said, the armies normally calculate figures by looking at certain signs. One of them is a fire. 
So had we lit the fires, they would have seen these people are very few in number and the following day because they would have been very, very upbeat about winning over a small number of people, perhaps they would have attacked us. Number one. Number two is, when they were going away, we did not want to inflict greater harm and so on. We had achieved what we wanted to, now we were returning. The Prophet ﷺ said Amr ibn al-As was correct and the Prophet ﷺ praised him a lot. Thereafter, the Prophet ﷺ sent several platoons in several directions to deal with people who had sided either with the Allies before when they had come for the Battle of Khandak, the Battle of the Trench, or those who had sided with the people in Mu'ta, with the Romans in Mu'ta. And the Prophet ﷺ sent Abu Ubaidah, Amir ibn al-Jarrah, with 300 men on the coast. And I'm making mention of this for one reason. You will see it just now. There were several platoons. We are just talking of one of them. As he went on the coast to a place or to a people known as Juhayna, the Prophet ﷺ told him to go to a specific place and camp and wait for these people. As they are passing, they will then be attacked. So they went to that specific place and they waited. When they waited, 300 men they ran out of food because they had been there for a long period of time. When they ran out of food, they had the son of Sa'd ibn Ubadah. Sa'd ibn Ubadah was one of the leaders in Medina Munawwara of the Ansar. One of his sons named Qais ibn Sa'd ibn Ubadah. They used to call him Al-Kareem ibn Al-Kareem. The most generous, the son of the most generous. His father was a very generous man. So he had come with some camels which he had borrowed from his father for this particular war. So when he came, they, when they said, we are hungry, he said, slaughter one of my camels. They slaughtered one. The next day, they slaughtered another one. The next day, they slaughtered the third one to eat. And after that, Abu Ubaidah told him, no more slaughtering these animals because they're not yours. They belong to your father. And you have just borrowed them. And we don't know if we are going to be able to give them back. We cannot return them. We are eating them. They are becoming extinct, meaning we're eating them. They're being eaten up. And at that point, it is reported in the authentic narrations that from the coast, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala caused a huge fish like a whale to be spat out of the sea. And it came, they ate from it for more than two weeks. Subhanallah. This was the army. And this is another miracle granted to the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They ate from that army, uh, sorry, from that particular whale the army had eaten. And thereafter, the enemy had not arrived. They then proceeded back to al Madinah al munawwara and their Iman was refreshed, subhanAllah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us goodness. Now, we are making mention of some of the most important, some of the most important occurrences in the history of mankind. Some of the most important occurrences in the history of mankind. So let's listen very carefully. If you recall, the treaty was signed between the Muslims and the people of Quraysh. And one of the clauses was that whoever would like to fall under the protectorate of the Muslims is free to do so. And whoever wants to fall under the protectorate of Quraysh is free to do so. And the two should respect that. So Banu Bakr fell under Quraysh and Khuza'a fell under the Muslims. They agreed with the Muslims. Now one of the men of Banu Bakr, he said something derogatory against Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam according to some of the narrations and this ignited one of the people of Khuza'a who was listening to the statement and so it resulted in a little bit of fighting between two men and what happened is Banu Bakr overreacted. What did they do? These two men were just having a quarrel and a debate and perhaps a little bit of a fight argument and Banu Bakr came in and they attacked the people of Khuza'a to the degree that it resulted in more or less a war. And these people of Khuza'a then rushed to the Haram area, according to one of the narrations, and they were telling the leaders of Banu Bakr, look, we are in the Haram of your Lord, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning they knew that Allah was the, the ultimate Rabb, according to them, even though they used to engage in association of partnership with him. So they said, no, today there is no Rabb. Today we don't believe in God. A'udhu Billah. And it's reported that Quraysh quietly, silently helped them and gave them a little bit of weaponry and helped them with some men and so on. And when this happened, it resulted in great chaos. 
a few people were killed from Khuza'a by Banu Bakr. And this was with the assistance of Quraysh. So when that had happened, Amr ibn Salim al-Khuza'i, one of the leaders of Khuza'a, ra rushed to al madinah al munawwara and he spoke to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa in privacy. He said, O oh, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are under your protection. We had signed and struck an agreement with you. What has happened is Banu Bakr have been assisted by Quraysh. They have attacked us and this is what has happened. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Wallahi, we will protect you. If it is part of our agreement, we don't break agreements. Whatever we consider against ourselves, if it happens to you, we will still consider it against ourselves. So this is what happened. And this young man went away. He went back. When he went back, Quraysh was worried because they knew that if this news gets to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there's going to be a problem. So Abu Sufyan himself decides, let me go to Medina Munawwara. He arrives in Medina Munawwara. Where could he stay? Who was the closest relative of his? His own daughter, Umm Habiba, radiallahu anha. Didn't we make mention that she had come back from Habasha, from Abyssinia? And the Prophet sallallahu had married her while she was still in Abyssinia. Umm Habiba, her name was Ramla binti Abi Sufyan, radiallahu anha. So Abu Sufyan came to her house. Now her house is the home of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa So as he wants to sit down on the bedding, she says, you will never sit on the bedding of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because you are a dirty man full of polytheism. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the purest of the pure. And obviously the monotheist, the one who calls towards one Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you are here, you're not going to sit here. He looks at his daughter and he's shocked. He says, you have really become a different person after you left us. No respect for your own father and so on. And she refused. You, yes, you can stay here and so on, but not on the bedding of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, not at all. Anyway, thereafter Abu Sufyan gets up, he went out to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And he told him, look, Khuza'a and Banu Bakr have had a bit of a fight and I just came to inform you that there was a little bit of a problem there, things have died down. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam understood, what's the reason of this man coming all the way? Abu Sufyan did not know that Amr ibn Salim al-Khuza'i was already there and already told him that Quraysh had helped Banu Bakr. So the Prophet sallallahu asked Abu Sufyan a question. He says, did anything happen? Did you people do anything wrong? He says, no, not at all. I'm just telling you. He says, well then why are you worried? So what about our agreement and our treaty that we have, Abu Sufyan says. The Prophet sallallahu says, our treaty, we will uphold it and uplift it. Obviously we will uphold it. If you have nothing to worry, we are holding the agreement and the period of it is the same period we had agreed. So Abu Sufyan thereafter went to some of the leaders of the Muhajireen, some of the top people who were there in, in al Madinah al Munawwara. He spoke to them, telling them, look, we, I am worried because the two people have fought and uh, what has happened is now the Muslims must not think that we have assisted and so on. All the Muhajireen and the Sahaba radiallahu anhu gave him one response. Don't worry, you are under the agreement with us similar to that which you have with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is one. You don't need to worry. You did not break any agreement, why worry? And Abu Sufyan then went away. <coughs> when he went away, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa told only one person what had happened. He kept it to himself. He did not tell the whole of his companions that look, this man had come to me and Quraysh had broken the agreement and now we are going and so on. We want to tackle Quraysh. He did not say anything. All he did is he told Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Oh Abu Bakr, we need to prepare an army and we want to go to fight Quraysh. So Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu says, Don't we have a treaty with them, O oh Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Yes, they have broken it. And he speaks to Abu Bakr about what happened. So Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu knew and he ensured that this remained between the two of them. No one knows. So then the Prophet ﷺ made an announcement just before Ramadan. He made an announcement to all the villagers out there who had accepted Islam, all of them. He says, whoever believes in Allah and the last day must come to Medina Munawwara for Ramadan. This Ramadan, all of the men must come to Medina Munawwara. 
So they all came, many of the tribes, almost all of them had come in to Al Madinah Al Munawwara, and the Prophet ﷺ gathered them together and told them, We are preparing for war. He didn't say where we're going. So they had to become heavily armed, heavily armed. And at the same time, he sent a few people in another direction altogether. So, so as the people or the Sahaba radiallahu anhum don't even know where he was heading. In fact, they would think perhaps he's heading elsewhere because he sent a small platoon elsewhere. So they thought that maybe we don't know what's happening. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, just around, or just before the middle of Ramadan, he proceeded. He proceeded with 10,000 heavily armed Sahaba radiallahu anhum, not really knowing where they are going, but he knew very well. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anhu knew as well. And he made a lot of dua, a lot of dua. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as he was leaving, he makes dua, Ya Allah, let this be a surprise for Quraysh. Ya Allah, let them not know that we are coming. We don't want them to prepare. Let it be a surprise for them. Ya Allah, keep this as a secret, Ya Allah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam of something. So a few of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum thereafter got to know and they perhaps even presumed that we are heading towards Makkah because they would know which way we are going. So one of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum who took part in the battle of Badr as well as in the battle, oh, as well as in Sulh al hudaybiyah he was also in Hudaybiyah, by the name of Hatib ibn Abi Balta'ah. We recall the name, Hatib ibn Abi Balta'ah radiallahu anhu. He had family members in Quraysh and he had a good link with them. So he wrote a letter saying, the Muslims are gathered, huge army marching towards Makkah, perhaps they're entering Makkah, be prepared, be warned and so on. And he sent it with one of the slave girls. And he said, go to Makkah and give it to so and so. And whatever happens, don't release this letter. Don't show anyone, hide it, because it's very dangerous. So she hid this letter and she began to go. In the meantime, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informs Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that Hatib ibn Abi Balta has sent a specific person going to Makkah with the news. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sends three of his companions, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Zubair ibn al-Awwam, and al-Mikdad ibn al-Aswad radiallahu anhum jami'an. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent them and told them, when you get to Rawdat Khakh, you will find a woman there. She has a letter. Bring the letter back. When they got there, they met the woman, they saw her, they asked her. This was the Prophet ﷺ informing them of some news. They saw the woman, they asked her, where is the letter? She said, what letter? You have a letter. She said, I don't have any letter. So now it's a woman. What are you going to tell a woman? She's standing on her own. She doesn't really have any belongings. How are you going to search her? Three men. So Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu makes his famous statement, very famous statement. He says, you have an option. Either you remove the letter or we strip you of your clothing in order to look for the letter. There's no ways. There's no third option. Now she felt these people are serious. So she removed the letter which was interlocked into her plait, the plait of her hair. So she removed it from there and she gives it. Subhanallah. And these people went back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who was on the path. And when he got the letter, and the Sahaba radiallahu anhum now knew that we are now heading towards Makkah al Mukarramah. This was a letter. Umar ibn, Abi, Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he heard that this was Hatib ibn Abi Balta'a who did it, he says, O oh, Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why don't you, we, you allow me to execute this traitor? So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks him, Hatib, what made you do this? He says, O oh, Messenger, I am a Muslim. I am not doubting my Islam and my Iman. This was a mistake. I felt I have family members there whom perhaps I could inform, but it was really a mistake. The Prophet says, this man is telling the truth. And he told Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, how can you say this to Hatib? You want to execute him calling him a traitor? When 
He took part in the battle of Badr. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّ اللَّهَ اطَّلَعَ عَلَىٰ أَهْلِ بَدْرٍ فَقَالْ اِعْمَلُوا مَا شِئْتُمْ فَإِنِّي قَدْ غَفَرْتُ لَكُمْ We've mentioned this hadith in the past. How do you know? Allah looked at the hearts of the people who took part in the battle of Badr and told them, do as you please, for I have indeed forgiven you. O Hatib, we have forgiven you. So Hatib ibn Abi Badda was forgiven on that particular day. Thereafter, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as he progressed, he had left Abdullah ibn Ummi Maktoum in Medina Munawwara in charge of whoever was there. And when they got to a place known as Al Abwa, Abu Sufyan ibn Al Harith, who is not Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, the leader of Quraysh, but another man from Quraysh, known as Abu Sufyan, they have a similar name. He came, he was met by the army, and with him was Abdullah ibn Abi Umayyah, a brother in law of the Prophet. When the two of them saw the army, the, the Muslims asked them, what is it you want? They said, no, we are coming to Medina Munawwara as Muslims, and we would like to enter the fold of Islam. So they too joined the army, and they entered the fold of Islam. As the Prophet ﷺ got to a place known as al kadid he was fasting, and he instructed his companions to open their fast, to break the fast because the fast became very heavy. And this is when they were going, marching towards Makkah al-Mukarramah in Ramadan. A lot of these battles took place in Ramadan, including this one, when the Prophet ﷺ told them that you should break your fast. And this is how it was permitted for those who are on journey to actually break their fast or not to fast and to compensate it after the month of Ramadan. Thereafter, the Prophet ﷺ met someone else who made him very, very happy. Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib. Finally, him and his family traveling to Medina. They come across this army outside Mecca. And Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib meets the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, embraces him, declares his shahada, and says, Oh Messenger, I am proceeding, making hijrah to Medina. Subhanallah. What happened? Quraysh was busy deciding. Rumor got to them that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is perhaps planning to come to Mecca with an army. And Al-Abbas says he walked out of that meeting and he gathered his family and he said, you know what, it's about time I accepted Islam. I know and I always knew this man was right. He is my own nephew. Let me now go and make hijrah. So as he left, he met the army and he accepted Islam. The Prophet ﷺ told him, let your family members proceed. You come with us. Let us go back. We are heading to Mecca to Al-Mukarram. So Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib accepted Islam just before the conquest of Mecca. And thereafter, when they got to a place known as Marr al-Dahran, they camped there. When they camped there, the Prophet ﷺ issued an instruction. We are 10,000. Each person must light a fire. So how many fires will there be? 10,000 little fires. Subhanallah. And by this, the numbers of the Muslims looked so big, so huge, that anyone who looked at the number of fires would feel perhaps there are hundreds of thousands of people here marching on. Subhanallah. In the meantime, Quraysh in that meeting decided we are sending three people to go and see what's happening. To go and find out is this news true or not. It was too late. The Muslims were already in Marr al-Dahran which is outside Mecca. So Abu Sufyan. Now which Abu Sufyan? Ibn Harb, the one of the leaders of Quraysh. He decided I'm going out. With me is Hakim ibn Hizam and Budayl ibn Warqa. When they went out, as they got close to Marr al-Dahran, they noticed smoke. Where's the smoke from? This looks like the day of Arafah. This is the statement one of them makes. So Abu Sufyan says, no man, it can't be that. This is probably Banu Amr. Because they have some people, they might have lit some fires. And the one says, no, it can't be Banu Amr. These are large numbers of people. You sure it's not Quraysh? Uh, sorry, you sure it's not the Muslimin? Subhanallah. And at this point, the Muslims, some of them, had seen these three. And when they saw these three, it's reported that they got hold of Abu Sufyan, and Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib was also one of them who had met Abu Sufyan and said, Okay, look, I will take you to the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam without anyone attacking you. My guarantee. So he took Abu Sufyan, the other two had left. And Abu Sufyan was taken now. He is the leader of the Qurayshis, the leader of the people of Mecca, the main person, the one who calls the shots in our language. And he is here riding with 
Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib. One narration says the camel was the camel of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because that was Al-Abbas ibn Abd al-Muttalib who had already met the messenger and he had taken this camel and gone out to look. And as this happened, he brought Abu Sufyan. And there is a beautiful story of what exactly happened. They took Abu Sufyan to the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. A discussion occurred. The messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told him, Oh Abu Sufyan, hasn't the time come for you to accept this faith? Don't you realize and understand? You can be a leader, you can be who you want. Abu Sufyan, he had a bit of pride in him as a leader. He always wanted things to be related to him, connected to him. I did, I said, it's me, I am the powerful, I am this, I am that. He doubted a bit, he took a bit of a while. Al Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib told him, and these two were very close. He says, Look, I want to tell you something. The Muslims have got something with them. That if you declare the Shahada, everything you've done in the past is wiped out. It's wiped out completely. So when people read the books of history, they should not think that Al-Abbas threatened him to say, you either enter the fold of Islam or we're going to execute you. No, he's actually telling him that when you enter the fold of Islam, you will not be executed at all because all your crimes of the past completely wiped out. And at that point, Abu Sufyan also just like the others had done in the past, Khalid ibn al-Walid and the likes, when they had sought forgiveness for whatever they had done in the past, Abu Sufyan declared the shahada in that place, and he said, I fall under the instruction of you, you are the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I am Abu Sufyan ibn Harb, entering the fold of Islam. And when he entered the fold of Islam, the Muslims were strengthened, because Quraysh doesn't know what's going on. Here the leader has already entered the fold of Islam. And when the leader entered the fold of Islam, Abu Sufyan, now the Prophet ﷺ says, O oh Al-Abbas, let him stand in a specific place so when the armies are passing, they can see who has entered the fold of Islam here. So as the Muslim army is passing, they're looking at Abu Sufyan and they're all in their takbir. They're all excited, mashallah. And they look at Abu Sufyan and then Al-Abbas ibn Abdul Muttalib says, O oh Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Abu Sufyan is a man who was a leader. He had a lot of pride in him. Why don't you give him a word that will be a word of elevation of his status on this day? The Prophet Sallallahu as he's marching on to Mecca, he says, Man dara Abi Sufyan amin. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan shall be safe on this day. We're not going to harm anyone who enters his house. This was a powerful statement. Imagine an army attacking a city and you know that my house is safe. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala Grant us goodness. You would have people like popcorn all around. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. And really may he grant us the best of this dunya as well as the akhirah. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa as they began to enter Makkah to Al-Mukarramah, he told Khalid ibn al-Walid, you go round and enter Makkah from the bottom, meaning from the southern part of Makkah, by a, a place known as Kuday. And as for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa he entered from al kada One is the northern part of Mecca where the Prophet ﷺ had entered from because they were coming from Medina. And one is right at the bottom, Kuday, where Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu with a group of men had to enter. As for the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, large numbers of people as he entered with Abu Sufyan. Abu Sufyan was told that whoever enters your house is safe. Some narrations say that he actually preceded them and he went in to tell them a few things and he told them whoever enters my home is safe and I have entered the fold of Islam. And as he enters, many, many people declare their faith and many of those who could not declare their faith in Islam because of them being worried about Quraysh now enter the fold of Islam. You might ask, how do we know that? We know it because later on they said it, that the only reason that we were not entering the fold of Islam was fear of our family and our wealth and perhaps the attack of Quraysh. So one by one, they started entering the fold of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ, now comes his time to enter Makkah to Mukarramah. To enter it victorious, after so much war, after loss of so much life, after so much turmoil and difficulty, so much turbulence, many of his companions having lost their lives, driven out of their homes, make the hijrah. How do you think he entered on a day when there was no form of battle against him? Because they knew the sheer numbers were enough. The Prophet ﷺ was on his camel. With him 
was Usama ibn Zayd radiallahu anhu on the same camel. And the Prophet sallallahu put his head down, so low down that it almost was touching the neck of his camel. And he continued to engage in the shukr, in the thanks of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he praised Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he continued reciting Surah Al-Fatih and a few other verses. And he is entering Makkah Al-Mukarramah, the leader of all creation, entering in the most humble way. As people are watching Muhammad ibn Abdullah, the one whom they looked at as a warrior, a person who perhaps is barbaric and so on. Quraysh thought that when they saw him entering Mecca, looking down completely, not even looking up, they began to declare their shahada one after the other. This was a leader unlike all the other leaders they've ever had. And his companions were all around him, yet he was the most humble, down-to-earth person that existed. Subhanallah. And as he went, he took a little bit of a rest. He announced a few names. He said the following people will be executed because they are considered people who have engaged in crimes against humanity. They have committed cr crimes and these people, they should be executed. The rest of them, nobody should fight anyone who enters the house of Abu Sufyan. Nobody should fight anyone who enters his own house. And he issued instruction, but he gave a few people's names. In fact, he said, whoever enters their house will be saved. Whoever closes their door on this day, we won't fight him. Whoever enters the masjid, we won't fight him. Whoever enters the house of Abu Sufyan, we won't fight them. Whoever puts their sword down, we won't fight them. This was amazing. Quraysh did not know this before. And everyone is talking about it. Did you hear these words? And each one is saying, well, I fall under this category. Let's do this. Let's do that. Then the Prophet ﷺ made an announcement. The following people will be executed wherever you find them. No problem. They shall be executed. Abdullah ibn Sa'd ibn Abi Sarh, Ikrimah ibn Abi Jahl, Safwan ibn Umayya, Habbar ibn al-Aswad, Al-Harith ibn Hisham, Zuhair ibn Abi Umayya, Ka'b ibn Zuhair, Wahshi, the killer of Hamza, as well as Hind binti Utbah. Those people shall be executed wherever they are. This was an announcement made. People are worried. From amongst them, they skirmished. Some of them did this, some of them did that. Perhaps we will see in detail what each one did. But the Prophet وسلم, entered Makkah al-Mukarramah on the 20th of Ramadan in the 8th year of Hijrah. And he rested a little bit where they had camped for him in Al-Hajun with his wife Maymuna bint al-Harith radiallahu anha and Umm Salama. They were there. And after a few moments, he got up with Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anh. He was reading Surah Al-Fatih and he engaged in tawaf around the Kaaba. And as he is engaged in tawaf, he is continuing to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, he is praising Allah, reading Surah Al-Fatih. And he is saying, وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَهَقَ الْبَاطِلِ إِنَّ الْبَاطِلَ كَانَ زَهُوقًا And say that indeed the truth has come and the falsehood has perished. For falsehood was always to be perished. Falsehood always had to be perished. And he continued reading this. And he says, قُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَمَا يُبْدِئُ الْبَاطِلُ وَمَا يُعِيدُ Say, the truth has come and the falsehood will never ever come. And it was never ever, it will never return. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us. He took his stick. He was on his camel, making tawaf on his camel. And he was kissing the hajar with the, the bottom of his stick. The stick would touch the hajar and he would kiss where the stick touched the hajar. And as he saw the idols, he began to poke them one after the other with his stick and drop them out. When he had completed his tawaf, he entered the Kaaba. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And he began to destroy the idols one after the other. Quraysh is watching. He still hasn't spoken to them. They're just watching. And his people had entered without a battle. Khalid ibn al-Walid, when he entered from Qudayn, he had fought a few people who wanted to fight him. And it resulted in a few deaths and so on. It's reported that two of the companions were martyred. But they had entered within no time. They entered Makkah al-Mukarramah as well. And now everyone was gathered around the Kaaba. Subhanallah. They are watching Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa as he destroyed all the idols one after the other, declaring the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as he comes out after destroying 360 idols, it was the first time the Kaaba was purified in that era. And they had put a cover, a covering cloth on the Kaaba as well. 
And subhanallah, thereafter he makes an announcement to Quraysh. Ya ma'ashara Quraysh. Quraysh is watching. They know what they've done to this man. They know what they have done to these people. Mada tadunnuna anni fa'ilun bikum. O Quraysh, what do you think I'm going to do to you on this day? This is the man. They knew they had fought battles. They lost relatives. They had inflicted damage on the Muslims. The Muslims had lost relatives. The Muslims had... Every family almost had suffered in some way or another. The Prophet ﷺ himself was attacked. They had hurt him to the degree that he lost some of his teeth sallallahu alaihi wasallam he's asking them looking at all of them the enemies as well those who had fought him in person are standing there and he's saying mada tadunnuna anni fa'ilun bikum what do you think i'm going to do to you on this day they murmured we hope goodness you are a good man son of a good man he says idhabu fa antum at-tulaqa Go, all of you, you are free. No retribution on this day. We are not going to retaliate, revenge, anything. Everything is gone and wiped out. You may all go as free people. We are here in Makkah, subhanAllah. This was the victory of Makkah. The most powerful statement of reconciliation ever made on the history of, or in the history of this globe. Idhabu fa'antum at-tulaqa. Go, you are all free. That statement itself resulted in so many of them accepting Islam. They realized this man is not here to play games. It is the character and conduct of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that drew people to Islam, not the sword. Subhanallah. Look at this justice, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And after that, Subhanallah, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was one of the people who came to pledge allegiance to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Then the father of Abu Bakr, Abu Quhafa. His name was Uthman. He had come to pledge allegiance to Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and the men came one after the other. One man was trembling in front of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says, "What are you worried about? I am not a king from the kings of the world." You see how he came into the city. He did not come in like a big king. He came in the most humble of all human beings. So he says, "I am a man whose mother is from Quraysh." And she ate similar food to that which you have eaten and your mother. Nothing to fear about. We know we have forgiven you. Subhanallah. He entered the fold of Islam, and the women also came in. Subhanallah. And the Prophet ﷺ looks at Bilal ibn Rabah, the same man who was persecuted in Makkah before he left Makkah to Mukarramah. He says, "Oh Bilal." Get onto the top of the Kaaba and call out the adhan. Subhanallah. On that day, Bilal ibn Rabah called out the adhan from the top of the Kaaba, and it was the beginning of a new era in the chapter of humanity. May Allah subhanahu wa taala grant us goodness and may He grant us a lesson. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam instructed his companions to look for a group of people. And I, I had mentioned all their names. Let's look at them one after the other. See what happened to them. First one, Abdullah ibn Zaid ibn Abi Sarh. He ran to his brother, foster brother, Uthman ibn Affan. Told him, "Look, please, you protect me. I heard my name is from amongst those who need to be executed. Only a few of them who were criminals. The rest of them were all free." So Uthman ibn Affan said, "Okay." And he made sure that this man was not seen. And after some time, he took him to the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam and told him, "Oh, Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam, I have brought you this man. He wants to enter the fold of Islam. He entered the fold of Islam, and thereafter." The Prophet ﷺ dropped his name from the list. Subhanallah. So this was one person dropped the name. The next one, Ikrima ibn Abi Jahal, the son of Abu Jahal. What happened to him? When the Muslims entered Mecca, he rushed out on his own, and he was going towards the ocean. And he told his family, "I'm going to jump into a boat, and wherever it takes me, I'm going to go because I will never survive after what we've done to these people here." So his wife, after she witnessed all these statements of Muhammad ﷺ. She, her name was Ummu Hakim bint Al Harith. She ran to the husband and caught him on the road and told him, "Come back to Mecca. Wallahi, the man we are dealing with is the most generous. He is a very generous man. He will never harm you. Come." This Ekrima was shocked. He said, "Are you sure?" When she came with him, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam already knew this man is entering Islam. He smiled. Imagine his name was on the list. 
The Prophet وسلم, smiled and welcomed him. Come, O Ikrimah, we have been waiting for you. Subhanallah. He declares his shahada became known as radiyallahu an, and he was one of the most powerful of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum thereafter. He loved the messenger so much. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Habbar ibn al-Aswad. He was a man who hid. He went away. Later on in al-Ju'rana, he came between Mecca and Ta'if. He met the Prophet ﷺ and accepted Islam there. He was also spared completely. Then the two, Al-Harith ibn Hisham and Zuhair ibn Abi Umayyah, they had gone to Umm Muhani, binti Abi Talib. And they said, we would like you to guarantee us. She guaranteed them. When she went to the Prophet ﷺ, the Prophet ﷺ said, no problem. You are one of us and we accept your guarantee. After a short period of time, they too entered the fold of Islam. Safwan ibn Umayyah was a man who wanted to commit suicide because he was fed up. He knew that this is my last day. So he rushed also towards the ocean and he said, I'm going to jump in. I don't even know how to swim. Allahu Akbar. He's going to jump in the ocean and he's gone. So as he is proceeding, his cousin comes to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa The cousin's name was Umayr ibn Wahab al-Jumahi. He comes to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa He says, oh messenger, that's my cousin. Can you not guarantee him some safety? Let him come, let him listen to the word or two and see. The Prophet ﷺ said, no problem, bring him. So he went, but the Prophet ﷺ was told by this Umayr that, you know what, give me something to prove that I've spoken to you. So the Prophet ﷺ gives him his amama from his head and says, take this. When this Umayr went, radiallahu an, he met Safwan ibn Umayyah on the path. And he called him back. Safwan says, no, I can't come back. He says, no, I guarantee you, the messenger has guaranteed your life. Meaning no one's going to harm you. So he, he said, here's the sign. I have this. I brought it. In When he saw that, he returned. When he returned, he did not enter the fold of Islam. No. He looks at the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and he says, can you give me some time, two months to think? The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa says, you can have four months to think, not just two months. You can have four months to think. And in a short period of time, he entered the fold of Islam. Safwan ibn Umayyah, known as radiallahu anhu. This was the character of the Prophet ﷺ. Take a look at Hind binti Utbah. Why was she a criminal? Because she had mutilated the body of the uncle of Muhammad wasallam, Hamza bin Abdul Muttalib. Upon the battle of Uhud. She was the wife of Abu Sufyan. She hid. Later on, how did she come out? When the Prophet ﷺ, the women were pledging allegiance to him, she came out and pledged allegiance. She was trying to cover herself. And she started asking questions. When the Prophet ﷺ pledged allegiance, he said, you will not steal, you will not commit adultery, you will not do this, you will not engage in shirk, you will not. And, she, and they kept repeating it. Because that was the allegiance they were pledging. And she said, we will not steal. But I want to ask a question. My husband is a very stingy man. Talking about Abu Sufyan. And he doesn't spend on me and my child enough. Can I take from his wealth without him knowing? The Prophet said, You may only take that which is necessary from his wealth without him knowing. If that is the case. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. Then the Prophet asks, Aren't you Hind binti Utba? She says, Yes, O Messenger, I have entered the fold of Islam and I seek forgiveness for all that has happened in the past. He says, Don't worry, you are forgiven. Subhanallah. Look at how, within a moment, complete forgiveness. And yet she was on the list. What had she done to Hamza? Radiallahu anhu. Wahshi himself was also on the list. He was also forgiven. And later on, he came from a ta'if and he also accepted Islam. Suhail ibn Amr was on the list. He was also, subhanallah, he entered the, the fold of Islam after being guaranteed by his son who had entered the fold of Islam on the day of Fatih. His name was Abdullah ibn Suhail ibn Amr. The same applies to Abu Lahab's sons. They came to the messenger and they declared their shahada. Imagine the victory of the Muslims on that particular day. Subhanallah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open our doors to grant us goodness. As I said, this was the biggest day in history. The victory of Mecca. It changed the demographics, geopolitical situation of the entire region. And Islam had spread almost instantaneously with no war and with nothing that was violent but only with the character and conduct 
of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions. Inshallah, we will continue tomorrow. Until then, we say, Wa Sallallahu Wa Sallam wa Baraka Ala Nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah, Bihamdihi, Subhanakallahumma, Bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa nashhadu.